Uh, good. Well, um, welcome to today's show, everybody. We're in week seven, so we're more than halfway through now. Um, and I hope you all enjoyed the weekend, um, and I hope you all managed to get out and get some fresh air, because it was a little hint of spring at the weekend. Uh, and uh, the other interesting thing is that on Friday it was my birthday. Woohoo! And I'm sure now if we were in class you'd all sing happy birthday to me. And I'd be very touched. Um, but it's no, but seriously, uh, March the 1st, as you probably know, represents the uh, beginning of uh, climatological spring as opposed to the spring that starts at the, uh, on the 21st of March. Um, so officially, March the 1st does represent the beginning of spring. So you may have noticed things like daffodils, you know, in the parks and crocuses and birds being energetic and uh, romantic with each other. Thank you, Ebony. I appreciate it. Um, and you'll be pleased to know I don't actually look any older. I look exactly the same as I looked the day before my birthday. So the point here is don't get depressed about birthdays when you get old because um, I always think of them as being at the start of a new exciting period in your life. And uh, it seems to work even at my ripe old age. Anyway, um, but things are going to get better, folks. And it's an important point. Um, as you know, the, the, the government has... Uh, this roadmap for the future uh, and the university too um, has a roadmap so but make sure that you keep tabs on what the vice chancellor is saying uh, about the university about um, about access to the campus and possibility of teaching being in person and all that so so just be aware of, of what the VC is saying um, as far as we're concerned on the course we're, we're going to continue like this until Easter at least and then we'll see what happens after Easter so so just assume that we're going to carry on with this online teaching between now and um, Easter which is only a couple of weeks away isn't it oh I, sorry I tell a lie um, Easter um, this year is relatively early it changes every year slightly so the the last week of term is the 26th of March and then we have two week break and then we're back after that um, so basically for the next three weeks, four weeks, until the 26th, it's, let's just, we just continue as we're doing. Um, but just keep your eyes on, on emails from the university about, that say, COVID update and all that, because in the summer term, hopefully we will be a little bit more um, sociable and a little bit more active. And hopefully you'll see more of the campus as well, which will be lovely, because the campus is rather gorgeous, especially at this time of year. OK, um, so without further ado, let's move on to today's exciting mission. Um, so as always, PowerPoint, uh, let me just um, let me just make it visible. So please go to JEE week seven. The PowerPoint is there and ready and waiting for you. I'll give you a minute just to download that and um, I will have a sip of water. Okay, so today's class, we're going to look at um, how to promote yourself. Uh, last time when you were with me, um, we looked at how to find work. So if you combine these two classes, then you are several steps down the road to enlightenment. Uh, because finding work and then promoting yourself, you put them together. And lo and behold, if you're lucky and if you do it often enough to the right people, you should find some work. So this is really important as all the classes are uh, but this one in many ways brings it all together um, let's just have a quick look at slide two um, the class schedule uh, now miraculously it's it's quite an achievement actually because there's been no amendments to this uh, schedule there usually is something usually gets shifted around or shunted around but we've stuck um, faithfully to what we said we would deliver in week one so you've had uh, three sessions with Adam and hopefully you're all set now and working hard on assessment one which will be in a couple of weeks time week nine uh, so you've got me today and uh, next week and then you've got me again in week 10 uh, hopefully you found um, Charla's contribution to the discussion uh, useful um, a couple of weeks ago um, as you could hear from Charles, 
account of her career so far, she's put a lot of thought and a lot of work into it. Uh, and that's something I really want to emphasise, uh, that finding work, whether it's finding an internship or finding a job or finding freelance opportunities, um, you know, the real world of work actually does require quite a lot of um, dedication and focus and uh, creativity in getting work. But hopefully Charla's experience inspired you because just in, in just a couple of years, she's moving on to really great things with her documentary and her freelance work and so on. Um, so uh, this week, um, I'm hoping, I'm 50-50 whether our next visiting speaker can actually make it this week, Cardolan. Um, now Cardolan, uh, like Charla, is also freelance and she has this digital platform that she runs with a couple of friends called Misa Magazine. Uh, so Charla, um, Cardolan is desperately busy and she texted me last week and she said she had an unexpected arrival of some freelance work that she needs to focus on but she's going to confirm with me today um, whether she can make it or not um, on the uh, on the fifth and one person who's not on there uh, we do have another speaker uh, on the 12th so next friday not this friday next friday the 12th of march um, we have another visiting speaker again another freelancer again a young woman a british woman um, who's been freelancing for the past five years or so. Her name is Angela Hoy, and she'll be with us on the 12th. Um, so we might not get Cardolan this week, but we will get Angela next week for sure. So it's you win some, you lose some. Uh, but there again, uh, Cardolan might um, might accelerate her, her, working, uh, her work rate, and uh, she might finish in time her freelance work so that she can join us for an hour on Friday. Um, but either way, um, throughout this module, as you see and as I promised, you, you, it's not just going to be me and Adam, it, it's also contributions from people who are really focused on specific missions. So you, you will get at least three visiting speakers, people from your generation who have a similar educational background to you, um, who are doing great things with their career at a, at a very ripe young age. Um, so on March 26, week 10, uh, the, the final session basically will be Vidisha, uh, who is uh, again a slightly different uh, career. She's a bit older. She's a, I hate to say this, but I think she's almost 40. I'm glad she's not hearing me because I might be completely wrong, but I think she's about 40. Um, and she's actually setting up a new publishing business with uh, her friends. So she set her sights extremely high, but she's had a career in journalism for the past 10, 15 years. Um, so her trajectory, Vidisha's trajectory, has gone a different way. So between th those three speakers, you, you should get an indication of, of what sort, sorts of careers are possible. So don't just think, I keep coming back to this, but don't just think that you have to get a job, you know, nine to five, uh, 40 hours a week with one company and stay there for the rest of your life. Um, I would recommend, because I did it, and I think these other speakers will recommend um, that you really get creative with your career. You can take it or direct it where you want it to go. And also there'll be lots of exciting surprises on the way. Things that you never imagined could happen, would happen, might happen as well. Okay, so that's the schedule. Um, slide three, let's just talk briefly about assessments. <clears throat> so we're all on track with these, I think. You notice I put big green tick marks next to two of them. Um, so the in-class presentation, Adam's been doing that with you. He's your your guide, your sagacious uh, teacher for that side of things. So you should all be okay with that. If you have any questions about that, Adam is the person to fire them at. Um, number three, we're way ahead of the game with the internship report and diary. That's due, as you know, end of August. Uh, and as you know, you had a very detailed briefing, have a de very detailed briefing. It's on Moodle in week five. The document uh, is called MA Journalism Internship uh, uh, PDF. So download that, read it. You did have some questions last time when we went through it. Um, if there are any more, I don't know whether we're going to have time today. Um, I'll try and give five minutes at the end of today's class. But remember with today's class, I've got another class at one o'clock, so I have to kind of be out of here 
a couple of minutes before then. Um, but I'll see if I can save five minutes at the end for just general questions today. Um, so that's where we're at with the assessments. The only two out, the only one outstanding that you haven't been briefed on, not particularly brief, you know roughly what's expected, is the um, the website and the business plan assessment two, which is worth twenty percent. It's only twenty percent, but it's really really important that you do a good job on that because that'll put you in a good position for the future. It will also put you in a good position for the internship uh, because you will be able to use your website to promote yourself to the world. So the deadline for that, way down down the line, it's what, six weeks away? It's after Easter. So what I will do is I will brief you and give you guidance and hints and tips uh, next week, week eight, and in week 10, uh, which is the final week. So those two weeks, my next two weeks of teaching with you will be focused on website and business plan. And I will guide you down the noble path on both of those. Um, but please remember, as always, this is MA. So you need to do a lot of work on those as well. It's not just me telling you how to do it. That's kind of the BA level. MA is that I guide you, give you hints, and then you go away and discover and experiment and work hard and you uh, try things and then you change it and then you polish it and then you edit it and then finally you submit it. Um, so once I've launched you down that track, um, it will be up to you to explore the capabilities of your website builder and, your, um, and what you want to do with your business plan. So that's where we're at. You're well briefed now. I don't think, as far as I know, you shouldn't really have any questions because it's all there very clearly and it's all documented. And I'll give you more help with website and business plan in weeks eight and ten. So and if you as I've always said, folks, with this class and with all classes, if you if you get ahead of the game, if you can do your preparation early, um, then it's far less stressful when the deadline approaches. And you also produce better work because you can edit it and polish it and improve it as you go down the track. So don't procrastinate, folks. Don't leave it until April the 17th to start your website and business plan because that will be reflected in your submission and that, and that will be reflected in probably the mark that you get. Um, so you've got plenty of time um, with that one. Um, and uh, I'll get you going on it next week in week eight. Right, slide four. A quick recap. It seems like ancient history. Well, I was actually a year younger when we had week five. Uh, so maybe that's why it feels so long ago. Uh, but just a quick recap on what we did. Um, so I, I did. I spoke about three things. Number one, finding journalism work. So places to go to find jobs and freelance opportunities. Um, I also spoke about journalism networks. So things like the NUJ and uh, Reporters Without Borders and all those sorts of organisations. And we also spoke in depth about internships as well. Now, the advice that I gave two weeks ago, please remember this applies equally to jobs, freelance opportunities and internships. So you, you can use all of these, the approaches that I discussed for those three applications, if you like. So real jobs, the nine to five jobs that you're going to do when you, uh, when you graduate or your freelance career, like Charla did, um, and also in the shorter term for your internship. Slide five, I spoke about going directly to large media organisations. I also spoke about, this is where you can really score, is if you find a small media organisation that's recruiting, and they won't necessarily have their own careers page, you know, so find a magazine that you want to work for. It might be a niche publisher, it might not have a, web, a jobs page on its website, but you can still approach them and go to the people that make these decisions, typically the editor um, or the boss of the magazine. So large media organisations are very different to small media organisations. There's thousands of small media organisations out there, but you need to find them. Slide six, um, we spoke about freelancing and this thing called res response source. And there was another one as well. I think it's called Upwork. But you need to find other websites where you can showcase your freelance work. Now, the good thing about these websites is that once you've done all of the sort of standard information, like your about profile and all that sort of stuff, once you've perfected that, you can copy paste it pretty much on, on all of these websites, which is why I put so much emphasis on those four key documents that I'll speak about briefly at the end of today's show. 
but if you if you don't know what I'm talking about go back on the previous PowerPoint and find a slide called four key documents because you really need to have those perfected um, to start launching your career so you need the about section the 150 word um, profile of yourself uh, you need your CV, you need your plan A and plan B, your kind of strategy if you like. And you also need the fourth document, the, the, the list of content for your website. So once this is why I keep stressing them, once you've sorted those out and polished them, you can, you, you've done all the hard work. And you can start populating websites like Re Response Source very, very easily because you don't have to rewrite it every time. That's the genius of this plan. Um, so that we spoke about um, freelancing by registering uh, and uploading your details to these various websites. Um, we also spoke about LinkedIn, which, I, like I said, I'm not a big fan of LinkedIn, but I, it does work for some people. Uh, the other thing we spoke about, slide seven, uh, which you can't really do now. Well, you can, but you have to do it online. You can't do it um, face to face is what I call old school hustling. And, and this for me, again, maybe it's a generational thing. Maybe it's just a me thing. Uh, but this worked really well for me. So meeting people at conferences and exhibitions and down the pub and your friends of friends. And, you know, when I say hustling, I mean where you can actually shake somebody's hand and, you know, see them and hear them speak face to face. It doesn't have to be in a pub. It can be over a coffee. But this very human approach ap actually absolutely works a treat. And I gave some examples um, in my uh, presentation of my career, how how basically most of my uh, major turning points in my career came from this approach. Um, so I do recommend it, obviously, when, when we're COVID safe and you can get out there. I really recommend that you that you go to meetings and conferences and, and discussions and NUJ meetings because you will meet people. And if you're bold, you, you will find work, you know. You need to be active with your interactions. Uh, slide eight, as I just said a moment ago, the most effective networking ever for me personally and for other people I know is to join the NUJ. I think it's £20 a year. To, if you join now as a student, um, I think it's £20 a year. So you'll get 12 months membership, which is less than two quid a week, which is less than fi uh, two quid a month, which is less than 50p a week. You know, 50p a week. It doesn't even buy a pot noodle, does it? Um, but I would really suggest that you join the NUJ and you get involved and you go to the meetings and you join all the different subgroups, you know, like young journalists, female journalists, um, and, and so on. You know, there are subgroups of the NUJ and get involved and get to know people. And it will, I guarantee it will open doors. I can't say when it will open doors or which doors it will open. But I promise you, by mixing with other professionals on a regular basis, you will eventually uh, be offered work and find opportunities for work. I really recommend it. Number one tip is join the NUJ. Um, yeah, and uh, my, the homework I gave you in slide nine, um, hopefully you've done this. I'm not going to check up on you, but uh, I hope you do it because it's for the good of your career. Uh, check out the websites that I mentioned in last week's class. Uh, find some more. I, I think I've only scratched the surface. I'm sure there are many, many, many more. And, and make your own list and add them to your favourites and keep checking in with them and get active. And uh, there is work out there. You've got to try lots of different approaches. You've got to apply for the jobs at the big organisations and find work at smaller organisations and get to know people and, and just uh, broaden your horizons. If you do all that and do it regularly, um, you're pretty much doing everything you can and you will find work. I don't know where, how much it'll pay, who it's with, um, but it will happen. OK, so that's a recap on two weeks ago, week five. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? Because I, I think I went through it quite fast then and two weeks ago. No? Good. Right, so how to promote yourself. So point number one, you you know where to find work. You know how to do work. You need to. That's what we did two weeks ago. You need to explore that now. I can't really do any more now. It depends on where you want your career to go, where you're based. If you're based overseas and you're going to work overseas, then maybe you need to take a, a slightly different approach. Uh, but you really need to put the hard work in now. Um, that's the coaching done on where to find work. Uh, and you had some examples as well from Charla, from some real life examples. Slide 10. What we're going to do today is how to promote yourself. So in other words, how to get your message over. You know, how, and I've tried to encapsulate it in one phrase here. You, you need to tell the world that you are those three C's, competent, confident and creative. 
it, it's no good just being wonderful and not promoting yourself. And I know that some people find self-promotion really quite difficult. Some people find it distasteful, believe it or not. It's, it's, in some cultures, modesty is really important, you know. Uh, and uh, so in the, I've taught students from all over the world, particularly students from Southeast Asia and Japan and countries like that. Uh, boast it, if you're boastful about your achievements, it's seen as being a real negative. And then you compare that approach to in the States. And I used to work in the States. I worked for big business in the States. Self-promotion in the States is seen, seen as being a very virtuous thing, you know. Um, and I think in Britain, we're somewhere in between the two. I think in the UK, the general feeling is that it is a little bit boastful to, to sort of say about all the things you've done. Um, but there again, I, I think if you, if, as long as you don't overdo it, as long as you don't say, I'm the greatest journalist in the world, you know, just tell them, just tell people what you've done and where you're going and what your, uh, what your um, qualifications are and so on. You don't need to add all those adjectives about being the best or the superlatives about being the greatest you know if you've actually done something substantial the facts will speak for themselves so that's what i mean by promotion you need to explain to the world to your buying public as it were that you are competent you can do the job that you're confident you know you have that ability to get the work done and you don't need people boosting your <laughs> ego all that i mean that's really if a lack of confidence it's that somebody needs to be told that they're worthy so you've got to believe that you're worthy of, of what you're doing and creative so people should be able to look at your website or your idea for for an article and say wow that's a good idea so somehow you've, you've got to uh, that's the, essentially the message that you need to portray that you need to convey to the world um slide 11 now these days, um, even though I say, you know, old school hustling is the best way forward, it certainly worked for me. Uh, but I do admit um, that, that these days, most of it seems to be online, slide 11. Um, so, and also with COVID, what I suggest you do uh, between now and September, and then keep it going, is to make sure that all of your online, uh, all of your online uh, facilities, all your online apps are in good order. Now, I would recommend, like Charla did, I think Charla uses um, three of these, I think. She uses Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. I don't think she's on Facebook. And she also has her own website as well, as you know. Now, about Charla's website, I noticed that it's it's kind of essentially the same design that she did for her um, assessment too, two years ago. So she used her student submission uh, as the building block for her professional website, which is another reason why it's important to do well um, for assessment too. Now, you need to decide for yourself, folks, but I would suggest, I would suggest that you use all four of those. I would suggest that you have a professional Twitter account, a professional Instagram, a professional LinkedIn, and a professional Facebook. And when I say professional, what I mean is, you know, take all of those photographs of you being crazy with your mates on your birthday and all of that sort of stuff and all of the, the laughs and the jokes that you have about, you know, Donald Trump or whatever, whoever it is these days and put them in a separate account. Uh, because the thing about online um, activity, as you know, from loads of examples uh, of people um, all over the world who get cancelled or banned or so on and sometimes it can be something which you might think is really innocuous um, but it can cause real problems so so what i'm saying here is draw a distinction between the professional you and the private you so if you are quite a, a modest private person and you don't put stuff on your private account about your partying and your dating and the big meals that you've eaten and all that sort of stuff then that's fine and i, I think i'm in that category uh, I don't really use Twitter very much, but I, I, I don't really put personal stuff on there, but even though it's my personal account. So, the, and, but it's really, really, really important. Don't let one sort of blend into the other because it can establish you in a very negative light if you do it wrongly. And try and get different content on each of the four or each of the five, should I say, with the website. So it is pretty boring if you've got exactly the same stuff on Twitter as you've got on Instagram. You don't need to do a lot with, with your online promotion, but make sure you're active, that you're active. The third point, you know, so adding links, you know, link a link to a piece of research about journalism, you know, 
uh, there's plenty out there, you know, discussions about the area that you are a journalist in. So if, it's, if you're a human rights journalist, put, include discussions on your Twitter account or Instagram about human rights issues, you know, and your likes, you know, you may have discovered a new podcast or whatever it might be. But what you need to do is present yourself uh, as, a, as, a, as a sort of an active and intelligent and thoughtful and, uh, and accurate as well. So make sure there are no spelling mistakes in there. Uh, you know, when you're doing stuff on online. Um, yeah, so include uh, links on... I missed one out, sorry. Second point, you also need to include links on your website. So if you remember, Charla, she spoke about her signature for her email. So at the end, when she sends an email, she has her signature, and it has her Twitter account and her Instagram account and her website at the end. So your website really is the, is the central point. It's the hub if you like, of all of your online promotion. So even though I don't use my website these days, um, if you remember on the right-hand side, I have Twitter, email, and YouTube on the homepage of my website. So use your website as, as a focal point for all of your online activity. Um, also, and this is what online promotion is very good at, uh, and Twitter and Facebook and, and LinkedIn for sure. Look for groups within those um, social media uh, platforms. Uh, so things like female journalists, if you want to be a war reporter, there will be a, a discussion group um, for war reporters. If you're a lifestyle journalist, if you're a fashion journalist, find those subgroups and get involved with, with those people as well. Um, add contact, nothing wrong with that, with adding contact. So editors, you know, senior editors, senior journalists, um, researchers or whatever it might be. But don't just add them, you know, I, I recommend that you also interact. Uh, and the, the point here is to, I keep coming back to this point, the difference between active and passive. And the thing about online promotion, it's very easy to be passive. It's very easy just to set up your account and then just to sit back and wait for things to happen. That's passive. Active is when you make things happen, you know. So if you read an article by somebody and uh, it's really stimulating and it kicks off an idea in your mind, drop that, find that, that journalist and send her an email and say how much you enjoyed it, you know. So that is active and it's more human that you're actually talking to people individually. So, so when you add contacts, make sure you interact with them as well. Um, next point, this is one about really more about personal style. Uh, and I must say, when I, whenever I get what I call robotic interactions online, whether it's an email or a comment on Instagram or Facebook or something, I really get uh, turned off when, I, when it's robotic. When it's, what, what I mean by that is it's the, the interaction sounds like every single interaction I've had before. You know, and, and I sometimes get that with applications and emails I get at my university account. When people say, uh, dear Dr. Merrill, uh, I must say that I was really impressed by your, you know, the, the, the website of your prestigious university, you know. And, and when people apply and they talk about the course, but they don't talk anything specifically about the course, it's clear that they've, that, that they've sent the same email to every other university in the UK, you know. So, so don't be robotic. Say something, say so, in your email, say something specific about that person or about that magazine to, that demonstrates that you know who that person is and that you've read her work. And if you're writing to an editor, make it clear that, that, that you know what their magazine's all about. Don't just say, I really want to write for your prestigious magazine, you know? So, so if you're going to go for the New Statesman or something, say, you know, I've been reading the New Statesman for 20 years, as I have, you know, and it's one of my life ambitions is to get published in the, the UK's best political magazine, you know, and also be ethical. This is obvious, you know, but just to remind you, don't don't slag people off um, using your online accounts. Uh, it could backfire really, really bad. I mean, by all, by all means, argue your case passionately if it's something, you know, very emotive like poverty or human rights abuse or something. Obviously, you're going to have to use strong language, but but don't don't slag people off you know it it can really backfire and it can be misconstrued and don't don't be sarcastic or ironic that's the other thing in your interactions it's very difficult to do in writing um and the thing to do when you when you've built up <coughs> um some contacts 
and um, and this works a treat because I've tried it before and it works brilliantly and I'll, I'll touch on th this again a bit later but journalists and editors journalists more than editors because editors are always desperately busy but journalists and academics um, generally we like speaking about ourselves and our work um, so if you want advice find somebody online a senior journalist who you admire uh, and ask them for advice don't just say you know dear Mr. Smith, I want, I'm a young journalist, can you give me any advice? D don't say that. Be specific. So if it's a war reporter, uh, you know, make sure that you, and if you you want to be a war reporter, check the person out with, with their profile, their Wikipedia page or whatever. And then ask, and, and it should it should be apparent in your email to them that, that you know what their work's all about. But ask for a little bit more advice, you know? about getting a start in you know a start in the career of, of war reporting uh, advice and guidance and you'll be amazed how many people reply you'll be absolutely amazed so i always encourage people in your position to have journalistic role models you know people that you whose work you read or watch people like stacy dooley or louis theroux or whatever you know so in those cases add them to your add louis and stacy to your twitter account your linkedin etc and, uh, you know, if that's the track you want your career to go down, you know, drop them a very short, very polite, gently flattering email and ask them for advice. And you never know, you might get a dialogue going. And then Louis, for example, he's always making documentaries. He might be announced on his Twitter page that he's looking for a researcher for the next documentary. Get in touch with him and he will hopefully remember you because you've asked him a question a couple of months earlier. And the other thing you can do if you're bold and you've got a good idea and you've developed a, a reasonable relationship with somebody, you can pitch for work. You know, so you can DM them, you can direct message people that you've met on Twitter and LinkedIn and so on. And uh, if you've got ideas for articles or podcasts or whatever it might be, um, you can pitch for work. But just be aware that th this slide, there's a lot of information on this slide. And what you need to do is take a, like a holistic view of your of your online presence so you need to first you need to question you know do you need and want all of these different platforms i would suggest that you have at least three or four i would suggest you even though your generation in your 20s you don't really do facebook it's definitely worthwhile for professional connections uh because uh, because a lot of people in my a lot of senior people in my generation and we use facebook a lot of magazines and publishers and production companies use facebook so even though you might not want to do it and you're more sort of Snapchat, that sort of thing, uh, Facebook is a good idea. So I, I would reconsider what currently what your presence is. And I would, um, over the next couple of weeks, I would start um, building up your, your, um, your, your activities on there and uh, think about your profile, how you present yourself. Just think professional, professional, professional and start adding context and use your website like I said as a focal point for all this so you're the home page of your website I would recommend that you have on your home page your about section um, and then your navigation obviously at the top for all of your other pages but somewhere on that page make it really obvious that you've got this social media presence so you need to be consistent across all of these platforms but like I said don't put the same stuff on every one because that just gets boring so there, those are the platforms. Those are the platforms. Uh, slide 12. Um, and as, I, as always, I strongly recommend the first word, active, that you do active self-promotion. You've really got to get out there and, and tell the world about yourself. Uh, you, it's not, it doesn't really work if you just set up a website and set up your social media and you sit back and wait for it to happen. You need to get out there. So I've, I've given you some examples of how to get the message over actively online uh, but there are three other vital things that you need to master um, when it comes to active self-promotion now the first thing is we, we started this uh, two weeks ago so I, I got you started on the cover letter stroke cover email looking for a job or an internship now what we will do on Friday this week can everybody bring their first attempt at, at the cover letter stroke cover email on uh, on Friday and I'll go through that with you and I'll give you a, a model answer. Um, two other things that we're going to do today. The second one, which is similar but not quite the same, is a pitch email. So this is where typically working as a freelance, you have an idea and you need to find a home for it. Now I know that you've done some of this with Adam 
in feature writing. Um, I'm going to give you more coaching on it. I'm going to give you a, an example uh, and I'm going to give you essentially the, the, you know, the, the top tips on how to write a pitch email. And the other one, which is, I put it separately because it's not exactly selling yourself, but it is in a roundabout way. Um, I've called it an information gathering email. So this is kind of promoting yourself indirectly as a competent, confident, creative journalist. So essentially, if you need information from somebody, you need to master the art of writing an email that gets you that information. Um, and it's extremely useful. It's really useful, obviously, if you're, if you're doing work, uh, assessed work or paid work as a journalist. Uh, but it's also useful in terms of establishing yourself as a credible, uh, serious journalist because you can approach journalists and editors with an information gathering email and they will miraculously become contacts you know so it is so it's kind of related it's not directly self-promotion um but it is um it is related um so slide 13 like i said i know that you've done a little bit of this with adam um but i'm going to um talk about it in greater detail and hopefully give you a bit more uh, advice and wise words um, if you remember in week one, way back when, in week one, that my goodness, that was January, wasn't it? Uh, in the week one workshop, don't do it now, but go back to week one workshop and look at the, the PowerPoint. Uh, this That session was all about creativity. I gave you six techniques on how to come up with ideas for journalism. And I stressed how important, how desperately important it is to be creative in journalism. Because we don't just want recycled versions of things that we all, already seen and heard and read. So you need to come up with almost an endless stream of ideas. And uh, when I was freelancing, this this was, I don't know why, but it's, it's something which kind of came naturally to me. Some people struggle, some people have no problem. But I did actually have a problem because, I, as I always said, half of my ideas were brilliant. The other half were absolutely crap. But I could never decide which ones were which. That was my problem. So I knew that half of them were, were fantastic, but, the, but I could never tell whether the fantastic ones were great or whether they were rubbish. But the point is you need to come up with a constant stream of ideas. So if you have any, any problems with creativity, go back to week one workshop, go through the PowerPoint and, and see if you can use some of those techniques. Now, before you send a pitch email, before you sell an idea, there's a heck of a lot of preparation that you need to do. The email itself, when you send it, is incredibly quick, but you need to decide before that um, some important uh, factors. Um, first of all, is it the right publication? Um, so what I mean by this is that not, obviously, not all public, when I say publications, it could be a TV station, it could be a magazine publisher, it, it could be a newspaper, it could be a website. Um, so essentially, does that publication uh, have room for your sort of idea? So if it's a sport magazine, it's obviously about sport. If it's a political magazine, it's obviously about politics. But if you have a look closely at political magazines, for example, they do have culture sections. So the point here is that you need to understand your publications. You need to understand um, what you're uh, actually aiming at. Make sure it's the right publication. Secondly, the right person. Is the person that you're aiming your e email at, does he or she have the power to commission you? So don't send it to like an associate editor or an assistant editor. You need to typically to go to the to the editor. Um, and how do you find the editor? Well, before that, before you find the editor, you need to do a bit of detective work to find out who that person is. Um, is it the right subject? Is it the right subject for that magazine? Is it the right tone? Is it aiming at the right audience? And also, my last point, and I put a little note for myself in red there, um, the right time. Now, Every publication, or most publications, they have what's called a cycle, a production cycle. And, and some magazines typically are published on, I don't know, the first Thursday of each month. So for the week before that, that, that magazine is going to be incredibly busy. So there's no point in submitting, in pitching an idea when that magazine is basically being printed and checked and edited at the last minute. There's another dimension to this as well. Some magazines are seasonal, and I remember a few years ago I had a great idea for an article about football, and I pitched it in June, and the editor very kindly replied, and he said, um, not really the best time, Gary. And I should have known that, because football doesn't really happen in June and July, not in the UK anyway. 
So football runs from August to May. So there's no point in pitching a, a, an article if the time is not right. So make sure that you get all those th things right. Uh, finding the right publication and the right person, slide 14. Uh, don't forget, you've got access to Press Reader uh, via the library. So you've got access to hundreds, thousands of magazines and newspapers. Um, so what you need to do, for example, if you want to do film reviews, find the film magazines on Press Reader and then find who the editors are for the film magazines. So you need to be a bit of a detective. You need to go and find the magazines and find the right person to send them to. But there is the, the good thing is, folks, there's infinite choice. And, uh, you know, you've, you've got all of this online and you surely you can find magazines on every subject. Um, and you, by extension, you can find the editors. Also, think about the PPA members. I keep coming back to PPA. Um, if you remember from week five, um, there was a huge, uh, I gave you a, a page that had a huge long list of uh, PPA members. So you can go direct to them and mention, obviously, in your in your email that you're a PPA on a PPA accredited work. So you need to do some detective work. You need to do a lot of work about the magazine, about the publication. See if you can figure out when it gets published. So don't send emails when everybody's busy in the office trying to put the next edition um, it, to bed, as it's called. So it, with a bit of detective work and a bit of preparation, um, you can f firstly find the right person and the right publication. Um, the next slide, slide 15, th this is, and if we were in class, we'd have loads of exercises and you'd kind of figure this out for yourself. But I'm going to be really kind to you and I'm going to show you how to do it. So this slide itself might be uh, might justify this whole module, slide 15. So this is how you write a pitch email. Key point, keep it brief and succinct. So reduce the number of words to an absolute minimum and just get to the point. Don't have long-winded, semi-flattering sentences in there about how wonderful their magazine is and how much you admire them and all that. Everybody is busy. Um, particularly editors of magazines and podcast uh, creators and, and editors of TV shows. Everybody's busy, especially in the media. Really important point, and I get this all the time, and it depresses me when I, when I see emails with no subject line, I automatically think spam. Automatically. So don't leave it blank. Put something in the subject line which is simple, descriptive, short, and to the point. Um, and the, what the example I'm going to show you, a real life example, was one of mine. And it, I just called it Article Idea Class and the BBC. What's that? Uh, six words. So, so make it really obvious in the subject line what it's about. Next line, salutation. Salutation means the greeting. Every culture does it slightly differently. In British English, polite uh, approach is um, Dear Gary. Uh, if it's a younger audience, you can say Hi Gary. Um, if you don't know somebody particularly well, generally it's dear. Um, I think with your generation, I, I think you're okay with hi. Um, you know, and just forget, don't try and score any points here. Don't, you know, say greetings. And certainly don't say yo, Gary, you know. Just remember, keep it professional. Keep it, um, keep it uh, focused uh, towards the top of the communication hierarchy rather than towards the bottom. Ideally, and I gave you this advice with your um, the, the covering letter, keep it to three paragraphs. Three paragraphs works beautifully. It works absolutely beautifully. Um, and the, the principles are the same as in the covering letter. So your first paragraph needs to be who you are and what you're pitching. Really, really briefly. Second paragraph is to give more detail about your idea. So how you're going to do it. And uh, you know which contacts you're going to you're, you're going to go to, and and crucially as well, wh why should why should why should you do it? What what is it about you or your knowledge or your contacts that makes you the person for the for the for the task? And then paragraph three, what next? I'll explain that that in more detail in a moment. So throughout your email, you need to give compelling reasons why they should commission and pay you and pay you. So you have this is your creativity. You have to stand out. The editor has to read this and think, wow. I never thought of that idea before. And this is the person for the job. And when you've written it, desperately important, you edit it, you proofread it, you check it, you condense it, you edit it again, and you proofread it again. If your email contains any errors, seriously, folks, apostrophes, punctuation, uh, spelling, capital letter use, editors will discard it because they, they don't want to employ somebody who can't punctuate, you know? 
And I, I've said it before, I think, you know, if you were soldiers, you'd have a rifle. You know, you're journalists, you've got to be accurate. It's as, as fundamental as that. Your accuracy is your number one uh, weapon, really, in terms of getting a job. And then include your email address. Um, keep your uh, either um, your, your university address or your personal address. If it's your personal address, make sure there's not some kind of teenage joke wrapped up in your in your address. You know, big boy 93 or what, hot chick, whatever. You know, don't, don't go down that track because, again, people will make um, assessments on you. And like Charla did, I would include as well, if you have it, your website, your social media, um, etc. Time is running out as always. So let's just go through this, this pitch email. Um, slide 16. This is a real life example. Real life. This is me, your tutor, pitching an article idea to the New Statesman. I hinted at this magazine before. In my mind, it is the best political magazine in the UK. I've always wanted to get published in there. It's been around for about 100 years. Incredibly high profile, uh, incredibly well respected. And I had an idea, so I pitched it to the magazine. Now, notice it says there, weekly magazine. And I know because I know the former editor of the New Statesman. I interviewed him for my PhD and he told me, and I knew this anyway, the magazine comes out on a Friday, which means Wednesday and Thursday are absolutely manic. So do not send the editor an email on Wednesday or Thursday or Friday for that matter, because that's his day off. <laughs> so don't send your emails on the days when it's manic in the office. You should be able to figure that one out or find it out. This is the detective work. Very, very important. So what I did, what I did, because I thought, no, I'll, I'll be a clever person. And what I'll do is I'll send it on the Sunday evening so that it's in his inbox for Monday morning. And I thought, that's not a bad idea. I wonder if that's going to work. So I sent it at 19.48, 12 minutes to 8 on a uh, Sunday evening. So here's the real life example um, of the pitch email. Uh, in the next slide. It's a little bit uh, small. Um, we don't really have time to go through it, but let, let, me just, let me just bring you on to slide 18. Move, move on to slide 18. You can read it at your leisure later. Um, so, and I've, I've gone against my own advice here, and I haven't done three paragraphs. Um, but essentially, the, the paragraphs three, four, and five, they are quite a lot more detail, which because my, my idea was quite detailed, I needed to include those. Um, but just have a look at um, paragraphs 1, 2 and 6. First point, it's rather long. It's 426 words. I would aim more kind of at 200 if you're doing a pitch email. Um, so paragraph 1. So as I said in the previous slide, tell them who you are and, and what, what it's all about. So the reader needs to know. It's like a news article. The reader needs to know in the first sentence what you're all about. I'm a university lecturer specialising in the sociology of journalism. And I read your leader, in other words, your editorial class in the BBC with much interest. So I'm tying my idea into something they've been discussing in the magazine. My current research is tightly focused on this issue. And I was wondering if you'd be interested in a feature article based on my findings. So in what? 50 words I've summed up who I am and what it's all about so if the editor's interested he'll move neatly on to uh, paragraph two I'm presently writing up an academic journal article representing the nation uh, blah 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 whereas current debates tend to focus on single measurements of diversity my paper contains six factors gender age ethnicity educational background region of habitation and the careers of parents and partners so that ties my idea in with the, the bigger idea about um, debates about representation and inclusivity and all that okay so that gives him and so hopefully by that point he goes oh that's interesting he's taking it across six dimensions rather than one um like i said paragraphs three four and five that gives more detail paragraph six the issue of class in the bbc is currently very newsworthy really important in journalism folks newsworthiness so i'd like to find a home for my journalistic version of my article soon as a long-standing reader of the statesman i thought i'd offer it to you first i'm not being sycophantic it's true uh, naturally i can give you a more detailed article of i uh, overview of the article if needed and i'm happy to discuss on the phone in the meantime however i'd be very grateful if you could let me know if this idea has potential so that paragraph is essentially the final paragraph so instead of one two six think about these as one two three as in my previous slide okay so in slide in paragraph six here i'm saying to the recipient this is what i suggest we do so um, have a think about it. I can give you a more detailed um, idea um, overview if you want. I'm happy to discuss it on the phone. 
but I need to get it published soon. You know, so that, that kind of ties it up nicely. And then right at the very bottom, if you've got a personal connection or something in common with the person you're writing to, I always think it's worthwhile to mention it. Um, so I mentioned it right at the bottom. I don't know if my name rang a distant bell. We last exchanged emails five years ago when I was in the latter stages of my PhD. I completed my thesis in 2015, etc. So that's just reminding Jason that, that he and I did actually exchange emails. So I'm not a completely unknown quantity. So if you have a connection, it, it is worth putting it in there. Um, the other thing that this email also does is it boosts my credibility without being boastful. I'm not saying that I'm the greatest academic in the world, but I do mention an organization called MEXA, which is a, a research organization for the media. I mentioned Ofcom. I did some work for Ofcom, which is, as you know, the, the, the broadcast regulator in the UK. And I also mentioned my PhD. Um, so that uh, hopefully gives me more um, credibility as well. So there's an example. Like I said, don't use it as a perfect template, but you can use it as a, as a guide. This one is much longer typically than what you'll be sending. But look at how I use three paragraphs to, to, to put my, uh, put, uh, put my, um, my case forward. Um, let's just move on slightly because I'm sure you're desperate to know what, uh, uh, what happens next. Uh, so what happens next, slide number 19, my goodness, 12 minutes later, so on the Sunday evening, Jason is clearly working through his inbox, and he says, many thanks, Gary, woohoo, um, and then he copies me to this guy called George Eaton, George was the political editor of the magazine at the time, so, so Jason is the big boss, and George is the person in charge of the politics section, so the big boss says to his underling, George, this looks interesting, is it a trends piece for observation? Uh, which is a part of the magazine question mark so my kind of my heart jumped but it also sank a little bit when i read this because i thought great the boss is on my side but it's not his decision the decision is for the political editor slide 20 so i couldn't control my glee and within 16 minutes of reading that email um i replied to jason thanking him for the rapid and positive reply and i also copied george and I said, George, please let me know if you want any more info or need to discuss. And then, of course, it all went quiet. Uh, so I, so it's perfectly acceptable. In fact, you should um, follow up within a week. So if you pitch an idea and not heard anything, very gently, very politely, follow up in a week. So I followed up the week after. Again, I avoided the busy days for the magazines. So slide 21, there's my follow-up email. And then uh, about four days later, George finally got to my email and he said, sorry for the delay. He's interested in the sub subject, but they've got quite a long backlog and we'll pass on it for now. So it was, as we say in English, very close, but no cigar. So I actually did the most difficult thing, which is selling it to the boss. Uh, typically, he or she is the most difficult person to convert because they have to pay you for it. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't convince uh, George, who's the political editor. If I'd had more energy at the time, I would have followed through on that. But my day job, my teaching job took over, um, took priority at the time. So I didn't really follow it through. But that gives you an idea of, of what a successful pitch email looks like. Um, as always, folks, I've run out of time. Let's do information gathering email <clears throat> and the other stuff on uh, on Friday. Uh, so any questions so far about promotion or anything else? We've, we've got just a couple of minutes. Are we all okay? Generally okay. But you can use my, my example of a pitch email there and you can, you, you know, you need, you need to modify it for your own purposes, but essentially that's what pitch emails are. Editors have an expectation of what a pitch email looks like. And it's essentially that three paragraph approach. Anybody got any other questions about this or anything else? Or can, I, can we go on our merry ways and uh, meet again on Friday?